Hello, my friends. Welcome to week four of season six of Be Formed, when we're talking about the life in Christ, morality, freedom, and virtue. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about the morality of the passions with Father John Haran, who is a teacher and chaplain at Bishop McNamara High School in Kankakee, Illinois. Um, when we hear about passions, many of us think, oh, it's going to be about sexual passions. That's part of it, but our passions are the feelings, desires, that we have for many different things. And so Father John's going to be talking about how uh, passions play into moral decisions in conjunction with our intellect and our will. So let's listen to Father John Haran. Hello, my name is Father John Haran. I'm a priest, chaplain, and teacher at Bishop McNamara in Kankakee. I'm recording here in my classroom. And so I'm happy to join you for this B-Form season. And the topic today is the morality of the passions. That means we get to talk about our feelings. For the guys, it can be a kind of a tough topic, but for the ladies, uh, usually feelings are easy to talk about. Uh, the reason we talk about them is our feelings are real, whether we acknowledge them or not, and they often have a large part that influences our action. And so there is a chance to, to look into the church teaching on the passions, on our feelings, and how it influences our moral living. Before we go into the topic, I'd like to lead us in a prayer, the prayer called the Sushipe Prayer from St. Ignatius of Loyola. This is a great prayer for sharing our whole heart, our whole self with God, sharing everything and asking for his guidance and everything. And so, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, that's called the Sushi Pei Prayer from St. Ignatius of Loyola. So we begin. What are the passions? The Catechism describes passions as a Christian term for feelings. Feelings or passions are emotions or movements of the sensitive appetite that incline us to act or not to act in regard to something felt or imagined to be good or evil. That line is 1763 in the Catechism. When we think of the feelings, the passions, again, it can be a little complicated. What does this have to do with our moral life? I think it's best to consider this as an attraction or an aversion. So for some things, with our feelings, we're drawn in, and for other things, we're kind of repulsed. And that's a good starting point for us. We're drawn into, we're attracted to what, what appears to be good, what we perceive to be good, and we're repulsed from what we perceive or believe or feel to be evil. And in our moral life, that's going to be part of what's going on, and our feelings have a part of that, a part of why we are drawn in, or why we're gonna be repulsed. There's a listing of different feelings here, and I'll think about those uh, five or six uh, with an example. They list love and hatred, joy, sadness, anger, and fear. They're called passions in a sense that they happen to us, right? We don't control where they come from, but they sort of, like we sort of suffer them or we, we feel them. And that's why they're called the passions. But again, if we think of it like an attraction or an aversion, here's an example. Let's say that I'm attracted to pizza. And let's imagine, especially Lou Malnati's deep dish pizza. Mm. So I can say I love Lou Malnati's pizza in a way that I don't love other things. So like I might have an aversion, like I don't like fish, but I love pizza, and it'll change the way I act. So because of my love or my attraction for the pizza, 
I'll be motivated to do things like I'll get in the car and I'll drive to the pizza shop and I'll be hopeful, I'll be excited for the chance to share that. But I wouldn't do that for the fish place. Like I'd be like, no, I don't want to go. I, I don't want to be there. And like I'd drive away faster, but I'd drive with excitement to the pizza place. Just as I was hopeful because of my love, my attraction to it, I would also feel joy when I, ha when I can possess and delight in the pizza that I'm eating. Like, so when I have the slice, I'm happy. I would feel sad when it's gone, like when I finish the whole pizza. And I would be angry if someone were like taking the pizza or stopping me from eating it because I wanted to eat it there. Steal my last slice would make me pretty upset. I might be afraid that the, the shop is not open or there wouldn't be tables available. So kind of, again, something getting in the way, but out of my control. Um, and all these feelings are in relation to what I perceive to be good. So I love the pizza and I have feelings around that desire and that hope to share it. So what does this have to do with the moral life? Our feelings are very much part of our actions. They're directing in a way like what we're going to do. In previous lessons, we've heard about the parts of the soul, the intellect and the will. The intellect perceiving what's good and what's bad and the will being able to choose like what we're going to do and what we're going to want, what we're going to act for. The appetites or the passions can be called this third power of the soul of what is perhaps guiding our actions. If we're not choosing um, by the intellect of what's good, we might find ourselves being drawn purely by, I'm attracted to this, like or I'm hungry for this and I want that. And then my will will follow the passions. So our feelings are part of our actions. We might notice sometimes then there's, a, there's like a war or a battle in a person between what the appetite wants and maybe what the mind wants. Like there can be a little clash there. And this could be a tug of war, but part of the lesson today is to say it doesn't have to be a fight. So some examples of the, the tug of war, especially in a moral setting, right? Let's think of it this way. It's Sunday but I don't feel like going to church. My feelings are standing there in the way of what I might know I should do, and my will has to choose, right? What will I do? Maybe I really wanna buy something like a coat, like this coat looks so nice, but it's really expensive. I know better than to buy this, but at the same time, like I, I kinda want to, and my, my passions, my feelings are actually gonna influence him at because of the desire uh, or like hunger for that thing. Maybe uh, another situation, I know that I should help my neighbor or you know, as Jesus talks about all the neighbors, like everyone, but this neighbor is pretty annoying or this neighbor kind of smells or just doesn't appreciate what I do and do I really have to help? You know, like there can be these types of thoughts. What I'm trying to portray is perhaps like a tug of war and, I'm sure everyone knows the experience of being like divided in the mind between what you maybe think or know we should do and also what we feel like doing, what we're motivated to do. True moral perfection consists in desiring what is truly good. The intellect can affirm this recognition of the truth and we will know the difference when the intellect, the will, and the passions are able to work together. There's a difference between the tug of war and a cohesion of the whole soul, like the whole powers of the soul. And this is basically finding ourselves in right order when we're able to have a cohesion of the passions. Just like an engine that's working on all cylinders, we say it's powerful and it's able to go in the right direction that you wanna go, that's what we're aiming for and that's what we see as like a moral perfection, to have the passions directed toward the good, and that's what we're going to be talking about. In previous lessons, you talked about some things not being objectively good, and we might know that intellectually, but again, we might recognize a, like a, a feeling on the other side, and still like a desire for those things that we might know aren't good. That's another one we can look into. We are not fighting against oneself when the passions are helping us along 
to love God. So in our Christian view, the goal of our human life is beatitude, to be in union with God. And we also say that's perfect happiness. Our whole heart is called to be in this. The whole heart is called for that. And so again, our passions, our feelings are a part of loving God wholly. Just like Jesus says, you shall love the God with your whole heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So here's another example, maybe a silly example, but I always remember this clip. I never saw the movie, but I saw the trailer, okay? So I'm not, I don't know, I'm like embarrassed to talk about it, but the movie called The Breakup, uh, once again, I didn't see it, so I, I can't speak for the whole movie. But I remember in the trailer that this couple is fighting. They're fighting about their condo, apparently, but they want to split up. They don't want to leave their condo. Well, anyway, before they split up as a couple, the woman asks the guy for help doing the dishes. She starts off kind of suggesting like, hey, I think I'm going to do the dishes, like trying to get him to say, oh yeah, let me help you. And he just says, great. She says, you know, it would be really nice if you helped me with the dishes. And he's like, yeah, I don't really want to do that. Um, maybe tomorrow, like, I, let's just wait for tomorrow. I kind of want to rest. She's like, please, like, don't you know how hard I worked? Why don't you just do the dishes? And he says, fine, like, I'll do the dishes. And he gets up and she's now more upset. And she says, well, this isn't what I wanted. <laughs> and he's like, what? You just said you wanted me to do the dishes. And she says, no, I don't want you to do the dishes. I want you to want to do the dishes. He's really confused by this, but what's her point? She's saying, it's not enough for you just to do this thing. We want you to want to do it. We want you to actually desire my good, right? So in this relationship, you're not really wishing my good, like you, you aren't loving me in the way that I need or that I deserve. Well, anyway, the question we could ask in the same sense is, is your heart in it? Do you really love with your whole heart? And when we think about what God is asking us to do, are we just saying, I'll do it because you say I have to? Or is there a movement that we actually want to do what we're called to do and what, what is actually good for us to do? Again, we're called to love God with all, with all our heart. So the key question is, what do you love? St. Augustine is quoted in the Catechism as writing, passions are evil if love is evil and good if it is good. What is this supposed to mean? The passions, the feelings we have are actually evil if what we love is evil, but the feelings are good if what we love is good. So in pursuing a holy life, do you love to pray? Are you excited about that? Are you eager to go to Mass, to be with God? Because you can receive God's grace and receive His love in the sacrament, is, there, is your heart in that? Are you, on the other side, with the other passions, are you saddened by seeing bad things, like evil, in a moral sense? Are you saddened by a blatant disregard for God and his law? Are you angered by threats or worldly threats or snares against your own faith or your family's spiritual well-being? These would be signs of perhaps a well-ordered passion, like our feelings would be in line with what is good and kind of a version of what is evil. On the other side, um, do you see yourself struggling with placing other things before God? Or, in other words, loving other things more than God. Do you recognize, perhaps, a love or a desire for something sinful? Do you recognize an aversion for God or holy things? Those, again, would be signs of the, the passions being at odds with the true good. And going back to that quote from St. Augustine, if we love something that is not good, that makes our feelings bad, right? But if we're loving the good thing, uh, then our feelings in regard to that, our desires for the good, would be helpful. When we are loving something the wrong way, 
we see that these passions could be called out of order, disordered, and we would need God's grace for help in that area. And the, the truth is, we all can find ourselves this way, right? We, we can all find ourselves with this disorder in the heart, and that's called sin. And the effects of original sin mean that we're weakened like in our intellect and will, um, and their passions also can be led into this falsehood. But our, the work of God's grace, and we continually pray for this, is to have a renewal of even our desires so that our hearts can be purely for the Lord and set on fire for Him. So how does someone, so how do these passions, how do these passions lead us to beatitude? How can we be drawn by what is true, by what is good, and what is beautiful? When we allow these true, good, and beautiful things to draw our hearts, then we can be on this path where our passions are ordered correctly to God. The Catechism says that the passions are not good or evil in and of themselves, but only as we engage the intellect and will in support or pursuit of the feeling. So, the feeling itself is not in my control, right? I might feel really mad one day or sometime. Um, an example of this, uh, I was watching a clip of, uh, from social media, a fan watching a recent football game. It was the Cowboys. Anyway, he watched the end of the game. He was really upset by what he saw at the end of this football game. And he just stood up and punched the TV and just destroyed it. He didn't punch through it, but the screen was destroyed. So he punches it, he takes it off the wall, and he throws it on the ground. And his friends are like videoing this as he watched the end of the game. Well, anyway, his feeling is very real, right? His anger is very real. Uh, does he give in to that anger? Yes. Maybe he's totally out of control by that point, but we can see that as an example of where the passions are directing his action. For another example, um, there can be an attraction, you know, in a sexual sense, like a married man attracted to some other woman who's not his wife. And what does he do with that? We talk about maybe the feelings that can arise they're not bad until we engage it with our intellect and will. And that's why we have the language, the language of entertaining an impure thought. Like it's one thing just to have a thought, let it pass, or you didn't, you know, push it aside or you know, reject it. But on the other hand, to follow that and to engage it and enter into some sort of fantasy, or let alone follow into like some sort of relationship with someone else, so obviously that's going down an immoral path. You can see how the feeling can be directed at, but we also pray for a break, that we're not totally governed by feeling in our action. So in the case that the feelings are attracted to something evil, then the passions can kind of pervert the will and pervert the intellect too, to kind of incline in that way. And again, we wanna ask, am I controlled by my passions? When, the, when these passions, when the things we're attracted to are opposite of God's will, then this is like slavery to sin. If I'm just guided by passions, guided by passions, they're nothing to do with God, nothing to do with God's will. We call that slavery to sin. To sin. The Catholic uh, teaching is that it's better to desire the good thing, right? So it's much better to desire what is good. And that's why St. Thomas Aquinas, as it says in the Catechism, teaches us that the passions should be governed by reason. And this is a long tradition, from what I understand, that Plato likewise illustrates it's the intellect that should guide the will and not the passions, right? So he basically says, this is the way for good human flourishing. This is about virtue to have the ability, the power, to choose even what could be against, at certain times, your passions. But with grace, we pray for our passions to be inclined toward the good. So even to have a change of desire for what is good and true and holy. And again, St. Paul says, think of these things, right? Pursue these things. This is a challenge to our current culture. 
right? Our culture tends to exalt the feeling and follow your passions, right? As the ultimate goal or the goal of moral living in the, in the cultural sense of what's good. And so the Catholic tradi the tradition teaches us that our passions can be misled. It's not always smart to follow our feelings. And, you know, personal experience, I'm sure we can say that's true. Like we don't, we shouldn't always follow what we feel. What we feel. Some things that we feel or desire might actually be evil and oppose God's plan. I know there's been different examples of that, um, but some of the objective evil actions such as blasphemy, adultery, murder, again, there may be real feelings for this, but it doesn't make it um, good, right? So it's not good to do that, and we should kind of turn the feelings the other way. Sometimes people say, is this like a repression of feelings? It's a repression of the bad feelings, I guess, but it's not repression of feelings in general. And that's something inspiring, I, I think, of in the saints, who show us like an, a true liveliness and a true fullness of soul. So again, what we pray for is that the Holy Spirit can renew in our hearts a love for what is true and what is good and what is beautiful. That the Holy Spirit can abide and make us love as God loves. Quick summary of some thoughts. Having feelings is not moral or immoral, right? We don't control the feelings, uh, but the passions can be good when they lead us or they are in pursuit of good things. But the passions can be bad if they lead us to what is bad. So the passions do become moral as we follow them. Again, it, it, it leaves it to the intellect to, to say what is the good thing. We are not called to be like holy robots devoid of feeling. Rather, being closer to God is not like a numbing, but a, a fullness of love, a fullness of, of his joy. And, and once again, the human goal of beatitude, union with God, we say is perfect happiness. The holy person is fully alive and God sanctifies our emotions to love as he loves. And we also can suffer with Christ as he suffered and we can be strengthened in that as we follow him on the cross and in his passion. A final thought, having the emotions set right or correctly ordered is a powerful, powerful step for us in the spiritual life. As described in this poem by Father Pedro Arupe, falling in love with God will change everything. So I share with you in conclusion this poem. Nothing is more practical than finding God, than falling in love in a quite absolute final way. What you are in love with what seizes your imagination will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. Thank you, Father John, for that great teaching on the morality of the passions. As he says, the initial passion in and of itself is not good or bad, sinful or not. Uh, but when we engage our intellect and our will, that's when it can become moral, morally good or morally evil. For example, if I have a, a bad thought that involuntarily comes to my mind, uh, since I haven't voluntarily brought it in, it's not morally good or bad. But if I start to carry it out, if I engage my intellect or my will, then uh, I can become morally evil or morally good. So thank you, Father John, for that teaching. And I uh, want to encourage all of us to dig into our Lexio Divina. I've had several people recently tell me how the gift of Lexio Divina, praying with Scripture, you know, paying attention to words, phrases that jump off the page, have really transformed their spiritual life. So this week we're looking at Mark chapter 7, verses 17 to 23. It's the scripture that says, It's not what enters a man that defiles him, but it's what comes out of him. And this, they talk about adultery, greed, slander, malice. And this is where 
it's the actions. Remember, we talk about the, the object, we talk about the intention, and we talk about the circumstances. Um, you know, if you have those uh, initial thoughts, they're not good or bad, but if we start to act on them, what comes out of a man, that's when it can become morally good or evil. So check in with your prayer partner, stay faithful to those commitments you've made on your commitment cards. If you haven't been doing that, start over and, uh, Little by little, mind, body, and soul, human, intellect, spiritual uh, practices, along with our pastoral practices, little by little, one decision at a time, one good moral decision at a time will lead us to a life of holiness. And so let us finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the gift of our intellect, our will. Help us to align our passions, our intellect and will with you, our ultimate good. Thank you for Father John and all of our priests and bishops who are helping us this season. Bless them and their ministries. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. To you and to all your family, buen camino. Feel free to share these videos with at least one person. And God bless you.